Coming up on today's episode, want to pay $3,500 for a $500 Blu-ray player? How about the perfect 32-inch HD TV? We're going to talk home theater PC, give you a different way to get over-the-air HD TV onto your monitor, and of course, we got the new Blu-ray releases for the week of January 26, 2010. This is HD Nation. Today's episode is brought to you by GoDaddy, Netflix, and Gamefly. Welcome to HD Nation. I'm Robert Kern. And I'm Patrick Norton. HD Nation is your guide to the best in HD content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is. Blu-ray, online, satellite, or cable, if it is in HD, we like it. Yes. Want to do some show and tell? Let's do that. I have a new type of disc, people. Now, back in December, Warner Brothers followed Disney's lead. They decided to put a DVD in every, basically, Blu-ray bundle with DVD. Disney kind of does, Disney's amazing. They're like, we're going to do a DVD and a digital copy with every Blu-ray sale. Universal's nice. following Disney and Warner with the flipper disc. That's where I've been, that's, that's what I'm hearing them called on the web. Flipper of disc. HD DVD is what I'm thinking. Yeah, well, and literally, it's a DVD on one side, it's a Blu-ray on the other. Uh. And check out the edge, dude. It's like they're glued together. It's a little bizarre looking. Well, it can't be any thicker than a regular disc, so... Good golly, man. <laughs> How about that gooey edge? I don't mind that so much. It's just, I wonder if the longevity of a product like that, as long as the disc won't sure last disc as long as any other disc. Sealed. But the other thing I think might be the downside of that is having the two discs separate, <laughs> it's kind of nice if you're going to take one in the car, you're not bringing the Blu-ray copy with right. you. You're leaving that where it's safe and secure. <laughs> just Good luck with that. It, but you know well, what? If it's cheaper, it helps get the cost down on these things. Or helps overcome consumer resistance uh -huh. to buying Blu-rays. You can play it today in and what you have currently. Or play it in the car, because you can't play a Blu-ray in a lot of the yeah, cars. In go. any case, <laughs> born identity, cool. John, we have an email from John. Yes, we do. John <laughs> emails the question straight from this week's headlines, and he writes, Hey, could you explain what Netflix's recent deal with Warner Brothers is going to mean to us, the subscribers? Despite the spin, it sure doesn't seem like a very consumer-friendly move. DVDs will not be available until 28 days after release. This is apparently already in place, as movies released today from Warner are not available until February 16th. And I don't see the immediate availability of more, immediate, or more movies for streaming. Right. And what gives? Is this going to be a good thing? Hmm. John from Billings, Montana. Yeah. Thank well, you, John. Here's the thing, John, right? We live in an imperfect world where a lot of people like to download content they haven't paid for, which has the RAA and the MPA permanently freaked out. At least the MPAA hasn't started suing people left and right like other four letter agencies. And feature movies, series TV shows, they cost a metric ton of cash to produce, and studios and networks want to make their money back on their investment as much as possible, as quickly as possible. Now here's where Netflix comes in. By agreeing to delay the release on new Warner Brothers titles on Netflix for 28, 30 days, a chunk of time during which Warner Brothers probably hopes people will buy the disc. I gotta see that movie, I'm gonna go buy it, I gotta see that movie. You're not buying into that. <laughs> money. Well, I, I agree on making more money, though. Right. <laughs> so, as a result, Reed Hastings, the, the Netflix CEO, has negotiated more DVDs and Blu-rays for rentals from Warner Brothers and rights to more streaming content from Warner Brothers. And Warner Brothers, like the other studios, they are the suppliers. They have what everybody else wants, and lots and lots of people want to stream content. So the movie studios are basically pretty much in a, a position to dictate terms. Now, in the past, Mr. Hastings has had to go to retail suppliers when the studios tried to keep Netflix from buying new titles. He did an end run around them then. He did a deal with stars to get more streaming rights for online content so he wouldn't have to deal directly with the studios. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, the guys worked hard for you. And if you like the whole all-you-can-eat $9 a month pricing for movies on Netflix, Mr. Hastings is going to have to keep making deals, especially to, to get streaming rights on new content. And he believes streaming is the future, not disc. You know, he's like, disc is going to be around for another 20 years, but streaming is going to be the bulk of our business. So he made the deal. Look, I'm not holding my breath for a payment system to be tagged on all the torrent clients and servers out there, which would be nice, right? Download anything you want from anywhere you want because the overlord in the sky is watching and they'll, you know, tag your credit card. You're in a fantasy world. Yeah, well, it, and it's interesting, right? The Boxy, the little social version of XBMC that could, is adding a payment platform this summer to bring more premium content to Boxy users, another revenue stream to Boxy. Netflix, basically, they need more streaming content to stay competitive. They're doing deals. And the reality is, is you know, new titles, only 30% of Netflix's business, so they're probably saying, okay, 
I'll give them this, they'll give me something I want, and like you, I eagerly await all of those new online streaming titles. They'll show up, I'm pretty sure. Good deal. That's what good contracts and lawyers are for. Yeah. <laughs> if they can deliver more streaming content, I'm for a delay in getting my disc by another month. That's yeah. okay. It's I not perfect. It. I mean, no, but you know, give me that streaming content because I'm I'm finding it very <laughs> convenient. Let me put it that yes. way. Yeah. In the oh no they didn't department, it turns out that Lexicon's $3,500 Blu-ray player, aka the BD30, is actually a $500 Oppo BDP83 stuffed inside of a Lexicon case. Now, you it can gets see, worse. <laughs> it does. Now, you can see from the pictures on the audioholics.com website where Lexicon literally cut out the bottom of their case in order to match the Oppo's air vents. And I have to give props to the audioholics.com crew for uncovering this one. They've got a great hardware review of the product itself, including some great comparative analysis of audio output, uh, comparing both players, showing that it is the darn, it is the same darn thing, and in some cases, the Oppo actually outperforms it. And Please, just remember, because you're overpaying doesn't mean you're getting a better product. Yeah, it turns out the, the Oppo $500 product has multiple firmware updates, which has corrected some of the issues in the original version of it. Issues you would probably never hear, but if you're a high-end audiophile, this is pretty serious business. Lexicon, no updates. Still has the original flaws. And I keep looking at that picture where literally, like, it's the chassis of the Oppo that's dropped inside of the Lexicon case. Like, they rip the front off, and they, you know, there's, it's got a different switches on the front. And I guess they put a little, they said they put a little piece of dark blue, you know, see-through plastic to make the display darker than the Oppo. My faith in super <laughs> premium products is really a... Really tested by this particular <laughs> news article. Well, and it's it's normal for like company A to have stuff made for them by company B or company C, but this is just an egregious example of of just hideous overpriced badging. And look, there are some great hundred dollar, two hundred dollar Blu-ray boxes out there. And if you're using the HDMI port, dude, tell them. <laughs> totally. I mean, one place where you would spend a little bit more on a player is if you needed a uh, full a full selection of analog audio outputs. Okay. Uh, that's where they would use perhaps better quality components to achieve a better sound quality for analog output, but for digital audio output, it, it's normally just bits, and the bits go into a decoder, yeah. and it's more important to be on the AV receiver end in terms of getting quality. Yeah, spend the money on your speakers, spend the money on your screen. I mean, not to take anything away from Blu-ray manufacturers, but, oh, way to shoot yourself in the foot, Lexicon. <laughs> I do, I, before I purchase any new electronics product, particularly TVs or mm -hmm. Blu-ray players nowadays, I'll go look at the product's website to see if they've actually delivered on any updates for right. the product. Because if they haven't, chances are they might not ever, and it, the, Granted, everything that runs on software nowadays, so you're going to run across at least one bug that will need a, a fix. And if, with Blu-ray players, it's going to be a regular update process, if, if it's a quality product from a quality manufacturer. We hope. Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have been a Netflix subscriber quite some time. Why? <laughs> because there's nowhere to rent DVDs, much less Blu-rays in my neighborhood. That's why I, well belong to Netflix.com. I got over 90,000 titles online, including a ton of Blu-ray titles. They ship them to my mailbox. It's pretty slick. And of course, I got online streaming and I get unlimited online streaming and I don't have to pay for shipping to or from my home. I just have to manage to walk by a mailbox at some point during the day. Even I can do that. Plans start at $4.99 for DVDs, $5.99 for Blu-rays. And as a new member, you can score a two-week free trial membership. You don't like it, you don't have to join. It's going to cost you nothing. Go to www.netflix.com slash HDNation. Remember to type the www when you're using this code. You'll be, well, getting a pretty good service and you'll be helping keep HD Nation on the air. Hey, now we got a very interesting tweet recently asking, can I turn a VGA-only LCD monitor into a TV? Well, it just so happens that we recently got a hold of a device that allows us to do just that. And here to tell us more about it is our producer, Mr. Roger Chang. Hey, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me very on cool. my show again. So, what are we talking about here? Another USB TV tuner or what? No, this is uh, the K-World's ATSC slash QAM TV box. It's an external box that's designed to turn your computer monitor into an HD TV. Awesome. With no PC required. ATSC being the over-the-air digital signal, QAM or QAM being what you get from your cable provider. Yeah. In digital, some cases. Un unencrypted uh, digital cable. Cool. Um, and you know, it's, for what it is, it's a, it's a very simple and straightforward product that works as it was advertised. 
What kind of connections are we talking about here? So this particular model, the uh, SA295 QDE, is about Ooh. 109 bucks. Rolls right off the top. I know. <laughs> I wish they would come up with a fancier name like Leap, or not, you can't use LeapFrog. Like uh, Lenny. 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 It's, uh, it's, Lenny's <laughs> about 109 bucks here. And it features um, a DVI and RGB connections, as well as component video out uh, up to 1080i. And, I see, and I see a, you have a... Uh, yes. Different cables here for this? It looks so, like a DVI to DVI in that case. It so. says it supports uh, oh. HDMI, and basically HDMI support is uh, achieved by using a cable. A converter cable, so no audio. No audio On through, that cable. via this, the HDMI cable. You have to get it through the uh, stereo audio, one eighth inch jack in the back. Is that going to be a problem, you think, for most monitors? For most people, you know, I have yet to see a PC monitor with built-in speakers. I've seen them on all-in-one PCs, but I have not seen them on standalone. I've seen them, but I don't necessarily want to listen to them. So, um, And, you know, it's designed to be kind of a pass-through device. So okay. you can have your PC hooked in, and it will pass the video signal through this, and then the monitor's connected to this, as well as your uh, sound uh, and uh, speakers. Whoops. Terrific. And demonstrate this thing for me. So, yeah, it's a very simple product. Once you get it running, you just hit the uh, home button, and one of the first things you actually want to do is actually go through and select a source. I've selected terrestrial here because we're in the studio. We do not have cable. At home, I used cable, and it worked wonderfully. It has one of the best uh, digital cable tuners I've ever seen. It's like, actually better than the one in my HDTV. Oh, that's always nice. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it scans faster, and it picks up some of the channels that it does not. I would hope so. I, I just off the top of my head, I would say the, the menu is very legible in terms of the, men, of the font quality and things like that. Does that also apply to things like uh, closed captioning as well? Is it a similar yeah. font? The, the, the font is actually, for closed captioning, is pretty good. It's very basic, but it is legible. In fact, I find it more legible than some of the uh, DVD uh, players that do the, uh, uh, the, oh, the subtitles. I'm always disappointed. It, it's, not, it's a clear color that you can see. I noticed that you have a USB drive connected on the front of this. Uh, what does that allow you to do? So this device supports MP3s and JPEGs via the USB connection. Okay. And so you get things like slideshow support, uh, basic music playback. Uh, yeah, anything that you know, any kind of music that is in an MP3 format and any image that is in a JPEG format. Once you activate it, it's a simple matter of just following the file tree. And as you can see here, I have two songs that have a very easy to understand treble clef to denote that it's music. Good deal. And then on the pictures, it will basically give you a thumbnail view of all the photos in there. Um, not the fastest I've ever seen in a set-top box, but by no means like horrible. So are there any cons to a product like this? Well, one of the big ones is the remote itself. It's actually not very self-explanatory. In fact, it's kind of confusing. It took me a couple of nights to figure it out. Cryptic icons? Cryptic icons, very vague. Um, you know, understanding of, of what it does. But once you figure it out in a couple of days, Passable. <laughs> it, it sort of makes sense. Gotcha. Um, but, you know, if you were to pull this product out, it's definitely something you're going to have to read the manual on because you wouldn't, like some of these, like, what was it, the house and the slow arrow button? Home? Took me for, yeah, yeah home. <laughs> yeah. He figures it out. It takes me a night and a I, half to figure it out. I've played with a few remotes. Um, the other big issue is there's no real scaling adjustment in the device for ah. your monitor. Now, if you have a monitor like the one we have here that we can actually adjust the scaling inside it, we can adjust it to one-to-one. -one. You have to dig into the menus, though, to figure out, you know, hey, do I want the whole picture to stretch out for standard def content? And for high def content, you know, maybe there'd be another preset for that one. But if you have one of the older 5 by 4 the little square LCDs, remember oh. the square LCDs? Oh, yeah. Or, an, say, an older first generation uh, one of these that didn't have the scaling adjustments in, then it's going to stretch it out to fill the screen. And depending on what your monitor uh, might look like, it's probably going to look really, really weird, so distorted. make sure you have some scaling functionality built into the monitor before you go jumping into a product like this. Exactly. Okay. Um, and my final issue really is price. It's about 110 bucks. They do have a cheaper version. Uh, about 90, I think it's 90, 95 dollars. Um, that's just VGA out without the component and, and the rest. Um, but that's still kind of pricey for what it is. I was hoping one of these products would, would probably retail for under 70 dollars, maybe 70, 75 bucks. But no, I mean, yeah. you were telling me that there aren't that many options for well, products like these, are I, there? I thought there would be more, and it turns out that this is probably the only one that is currently selling new, like out of the factory and not being resold or refurbished. Uh, you know, on sites like Amazon, Buy.com, and stuff like that. Good deal. Well, so. hey, 
thank you very much for the review. And coming up next, hey, it's time for the Blu-ray releases for the week of January 19th, 2010. Michael Jackson, this is it, is being released this week using a 1080p AVC MPEG-4 codec and a DTS HD Master Audio 5.1 surround sound mix. This follows Michael through the early stages of rehearsing for what was supposed to be his big London tour last year. You also get 90 minutes of special features, including two making of documentaries and eight featurettes, as well as the HD vignettes that would have played on stage alongside Michael's performance. So if you can't bring yourself to say goodbye to the King of Pop, this could be just what the doctor ordered. Next up, we have a treat for you history buffs, World War II in HD from the History Channel. On two discs, this release includes nearly eight hours of archival footage combined with the new footage and interviews. Because so much of it is archival, the video quality varies and the special features are pretty sparse. But it's using a 1080i AVC encoded transfer with a DTS HD Master Audio 5.1 mix, so check it out if you're looking for a new perspective on World War II. Speaking of World War II, our next release features Kira Knightley and James McAvoy starring in Atonement. High Def Disc News calls it a good upgrade from the HD DVD version with an AVC MPEG-4 encoding and a DTS HD 5.1 Master Audio Mix. And Kira Knightley reappears in 2005's Pride and Prejudice, also scheduled to release this week, along with Fame, the original movie, Paris, Texas from the Criterion Collection, yet another installment in the When Will It End Saw series, Saw 6. Soul Power, Bruce Willis kicking ass in Surrogates, The Toolbox Murders, and finally, Drew Barrymore's impressive directorial debut, Whip It. You asked for it, so we're going to be talking about building your own home theater PC, but first I want to thank one of our sponsors. Video games are not cheap, people. Sometimes they suck. If you're dropping 50 or 60 bucks on a new title, well, you're going to be pissed off if it sucks. Enter Gamefly, the largest online video game rental service. They got over 6,000 new and classic titles. They got consoles. They got handhelds. And I gotta say, instead of gambling 50 or 60 bucks on a new game, how about 16 bucks a month, become a Gamefly member, and you get to try them out. You don't like them? Hey, you can send them back. You have one to four games in your house, keep them for as long as you like, no late fees, no due dates, and the shipping to your doorstep is always free, or at least your mailbox, wherever it is. Once you're done, you send it back, Gamefly sends you the next available game on your list. It is simple. If you really like a game, click Keep It on the Gamefly website. They're going to send you the box, the manual, all that good stuff, and you are ready to go. And as a matter of fact, if you got games you don't want anymore, you can sell them back to Gamefly for credit towards your membership fee. And I know one way to make all that sound even better, a two-week free trial. If you're an HD Nation fan, you can score a two-week free trial at Gamefly.com slash HD Nation. Some restrictions apply. You can see those up at the website, get all the details. And do us a favor here at HD Nation, support us by supporting our sponsors like Gamefly. Just out the idea of building a home theater PC last week, and oh my goodness, y'all had a lot of home theater ideas, especially questions poured in. Should I buy this box from this company to build a home theater PC? Will it be more... Oh my goodness. I'm telling you. Well, <laughs> we'll talk about them next week, but let's start by laying down the basics on this one. Uh, you might first ask, well, should I go with Windows, OS X, or Linux? Ooh. Do you want to use Windows Media Center? Well, that's pretty much what you're using Blu-ray or cable card builds for. Uh, well, let's put it as all you, if you want to run Blu-ray and if you want to run cable card, you're building a Windows-based PC, period. That's Congratulations. It. And with Windows Media Center, of course, you have the solid Media Center product with the tuners that it supports, and we can't wait to build a cable card system when that becomes available. I'm, I'm really looking forward to multiple cable cards, multiple Four. tuners, huge hard drives. Four but cable cards. We're talking a couple months out. Yeah, and, yeah. and we're looking forward to that, and we're going to build that on here. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, XBMC, it's an open source media player. Boxy, which is built on top of the XBMC source code, they run on Windows, Linux, OS X, and Apple TV. Boxy's adding more services, and basically paid services we mentioned in the news section and both are really built to stream media from your hard drive your home server or from online you know can you play dvds yes can you play blu-rays no now if you want to go free from the ground up not have to own an operating system mythbuntu is pretty amazing it's basically well it's a myth box on top of an ubuntu installation and it makes building a myth box from scratch super easy the last i checked setting up tuners if you want to do the dvr type stuff still not that much fun good deal Here's the thing, in terms of hardware, 
you got an older gaming PC or old work PC, an old junk PC, an old notebook, you do not need much of a PC to do basic video playback, uh, basic audio, DVD playback, dump XBMC or Boxy onto the operating system that's on there, fire up Windows Media Center if you have it, you're good to go. It's amazing how little processing power it takes to play a DVD or most of the MPEG movies. Totally. You know, MPEG movies, Waves, a lot of the stuff that's available out Definitely. there. But what about, say, for the OS X users out there, Mr. Apple God? <laughs> yeah. Well, front, front row, it's slick. I love the Apple remote. Boxy is cool, especially the social aspects if you're into that whole thing. If you want DVR-type TV recording on OS X, you are going with Elgato's ITV software. There is nothing else. As a matter of fact, I pretty much draw a blank beyond that. So if anybody has a home theater application that runs on uh, OS X that is not you know, front row or, or Elgato or Boxy or XBMC, let me know because... I, I just I just can't think of anything else you would run an OS X to do that. I guess iTunes, kind of. I would agree with that. It's not really navigatable by a remote. And all this stuff we think should be you know, a lean-back living room, 10, 12 feet away from the TV kind of experience. Everything should be controllable through a nice remote control. You'll have the wireless keyboard for when yeah. you need something like that. But you really want to, you want to break this down to where you can use something you're fairly familiar with already right. being a simple remote control. And preferably that will also control anything else that's stacked up next to your TV. Um, that would be nice. If you're not going to build a junk PC, there are a couple filtering questions you should ask before you start well, buying parts. First decision, is this going to be a gaming box or not? If you want to do first-person shooters, you need to spend a lot more money on a GPU and on a processor. Not so much if you're doing World of Warcraft, but you'll still need something with a little oomph. Second decision, is this going to be a Blu-ray box? If you're going to do Blu-ray, you need a Blu-ray drive, you need a decent GPU that does the, basically the off, bit, offloads the, the, the Blu-ray decoding from your CPU. And well, you still need a little bit of CPU power for that, too. Totally. Those but, menuing systems are But if you're brutal. not gaming, you can save a lot of money by yeah. not having a big honking graphics card. Because literally, if you're going to game, especially at 1080p resolution, and enjoy that full resolution of that TV, hopefully you're using, that can cost you quite a bit to get a card powerful enough to drive all those pixels. Yeah, you're spending at least 180 bucks on your graphics card. A minimum. <laughs> so. Minimum for acceptable performance at that, at that massive resolution. If you're wondering how an older PC, you're wondering if it's ready to play Blu-ray, check out Cyberlink's BD Blu-ray Advisor. You run it on your machine. It basically inventories what's on there. tells you if you have enough processor, if your graphics card is HTCP compliant. You can buy a $70 graphics card that will make a lot of older processors run Blu-ray discs pretty well. Um, and I guess you know, gaming and Blu-ray, these will greatly influence your choices and your options. Should we talk a little less powerful, a little quieter than a gaming PC? That's what I'm looking to do next. I really want something that I don't hear, I can hide, and is quiet, and doesn't sip a lot of power. Now, we've talked about this on the show before. This is the Puget Echo 1 from PugetSystems.com. This is an NVIDIA Ion box. You can see inside of there, it's got a Zotac motherboard. And the motherboard is incredibly dense, because not only does it have the Atom processor, which is slow uh, and does horrible graphics, but it's got NVIDIA's Ion system. And basically the Atom, PC, the, the Atom CPU plus the NVIDIA Ion means the NVIDIA Ion basically brings pure video HD3 decoding, 7.1 channel LPCM output over the HDMI. This is a badass little media box, and it's dense because pretty much all the Atom boards out there are going to have 802.11n, they're going to have a SPDIF out, HDMI, ESAT, a ton of USB, they have analog audio outputs, and can you hold this for a second? Of course. They SIP power. So SIP. SIP. Built-in Wi-Fi. Yeah, so you're basically looking at, it's like, you know, it's like having a notebook with a little more oomph on the graphics. Well, this thing also has a, a very nice, is that a, a SATA. SATA drive? Oh. Yeah. The one really Notebook expensive component drive. in this is actually the, the slim form factor Blu-ray drive. Those are not cheap. <laughs> now, I've seen some all. standalone boxes from companies like Newegg yeah. and others that were about, I'd say, in the $250 to $500 range mm -hmm. that were bare bones. That might have included some memory and other things as well. But they were smaller than this. And I would, I'd be curious to see if we get something like that to run as well. But this has the similar motherboard, including the ION technology, that I'm interested in for just smooth decode performance. Mm -hmm. And as long as I can run a web browser smoothly, that's really what I want for the web-based content, right. be it Netflix to South Park Studios to you name it. Anything you have, to, Hulu, you have to use a web browser in order to view that online. So I have to have a web browser and I have to be able to use it on a big screen TV. Right. I easily. Mean, in this case, you're looking at like a, uh, let's see, input, 100, 100 to 240 volts at one and a half amps. So you're basically looking at 120 watts to power this thing. So this is this is low power, and also because it's it, for all intents and purposes, it's passively cooled. Although they put the fans on here to keep things moving, you can make one of these that is super quiet. And you can have a small living room with a lot of hard surfaces, and you're not going to hear this thing running in the background. I would say right off the bat, if you need to save some money, though, drop the Blu-ray drive. Yeah, I mean, because honestly, I don't, I'm not sure what slim drives cost. I'd be curious to compare that, but 
I would think that some of the low-priced standalone Blu-ray players you can get today might be a viable alternative. Well, yeah, like a year, two years ago, a year ago, you know, because uh, for the full for full Blu-ray playback for basically all of the audio support, you're going to be spending at least a hundred bucks for a full application, sixty to a hundred bucks for sixty to a hundred bucks for a full application. Blu-ray drive is going to run you at least a hundred bucks right now, and for two hundred bucks, you can get a badass standalone Blu-ray. Drive. True. And for a little bit more than that, you can get one that does Netflix and, and Amazon Video On Demand and Voodoo HDX. Um, if you I, have an old notebook. I totally understand that. Having having want that desire to have everything in one device. Yeah. That I understand that desire, but if you need to cut the corner, there's one to cut. Yeah. If uh, another good corner to cut, if you want to keep something that's fairly quiet, if you have an old notebook, uh, if it has a DVI adapter output especially, or if your HDTV has a VGA input, recycling an old notebook can be small, low power, and you can basically plug a little USB adapter into the USB, a USB IR adapter and use your remote to control that or a standard Very Windows cool. Media remote. That's a really cheap way if you have the old notebook laying around to recycle it. Um, High-end Core i5-750. If you want a gaming system, that is the sweet spot of like a seven, $800 gaming machine buildup. Core i3 looks really interesting. Core 2 Duo still has a lot. They're getting really cheap, especially if you can track down one used. They have more than enough processor for basic gaming, Blu-ray with good graphics card. But that Core i5-750, if you want a badass first-person shooter, that is a great great, great chip to be buying right now. ATI's Radeon 4670, 70 bucks. Uh, basically, it, it offloads all of the MPEG decoding off of your processor, especially for Blu-rays. Um, does Dolby 7.1 over HDMI. I think the 5670 just got pretty much announced in the last couple days. I think that's going to be, for this spring, that's going to be the cheap uh, graphics, you know, for like World of Warcraft or Blu-ray playback or just, I need Windows 7 that's going to run. Not hardcore gaming, no. but... HDMI output with all the audio support and decoding support that you're going to yeah. need. Stepping it up, uh, probably the sweet spot to go along with that Core i5-750 is ATI's Radeon 5770. It's 180 bucks. It does great 3D gaming performance. I just bought one of these. True HD, DTS HD, bit streaming over HDI. And you you know you may want to <laughs> you may want to be careful with the with the cooler on that. Mine's not too bad. Some of the boards out there, or I say some of the graphic cards out there, have some ridiculously loud cooling system strapped to them. They have big, oh, totally. giant fans. It's a very hot part. Yeah. 80, it, 90 degrees Celsius. And Gotta keep it cool. No disrespect to a lot of the graphics card manufacturers, but they're saving money by putting you know an inexpensive loud fan on there. You can go for a third-party cooling thing. Or if you have an older system that you're rebuilding, you might be able to find larger, slower-moving fans or adapters to turn down the fan speed uh, or move your 12-volt fans to 5 volts to totally. basically... You know, if you're not building up a lot of heat, if your processor's running, you basically, you know, you, you run motherboard monitors, see whether or not your processor's running hot. If it's not, keep turning the fan down until you've you've, you've quieted down the machine as much as you can. Proper fan tuning, always yeah. important. Yeah, and I, I should say, though, uh, <laughs> Tom's hardware actually was benchmarking a lot of the new graphics cards, and uh, they're, they're finding like 40 to 47 decibels at one meter, which is awfully close to a PC, uh, running the Furmark stress test. And a lot of the cards, actually, they're not using that much power, especially in that mid-range, 4770, or the 5770, you're talking about, like, I think 118 watts at full tilt gaming mode and, like, 18 watts at idle. Oh, very good. So on the flip side, chances are your graphics card isn't going to be that loud. Intel HD graphics. We haven't talked too much about this. It's basically Intel went, instead of doing the Intel ABC 742-771 integrated graphics solution for mobile processors and small inexpensive boxes, they basically said, okay, it's Intel HD graphics. And it's kind of weird. I don't think anybody's actually enabled it in hardware or in software that you can access it, but it's supposed to be able to do dual video decoding streams for picture-in-picture -picture HDMI, which is kind of slick. Nice. Um, but it's not implemented anywhere we can find. And lossless Dolby True HD DTS HD Master Audio, based basically all in a cheap integrated chipset. Um, Intel G45 chipset, if you have an older system, already does multi-channel LPC-M audio over HDMI, and it accelerates MPEG-2, H.264, and VC-1, so that'll handle your Blu-ray playback. Face off next week? Yeah, well, if we get all the parts in, <laughs> let's we, start ordering stuff now. I'm gonna. I'm either gonna end up with a notebook or a pile of junk out of the back of my garage. You're gonna build an atom machine. I'm gonna finalize the parts list because I need to use it for at least a week, <laughs> okay. and to let it sink in and see if it's something I would actually use from day in, or week in and week out. The big <laughs> concern I'm gonna have is keeping the price down. That's right. gonna be that's gonna be a trick to keep this into something that is affordable for most people. I mean, I, I can easily see spending five, $600 on yeah. to build a tiny product. 
and uh, that's pushing the limits, I think, for a lot of people's budgets. I gotta say, for the Mac Mini users out there, uh, the people that wrote in responding about that particular product, if you have one of those, or you know somebody that's getting rid of one, get a hold of it and clean the thing up and refurbish it as your home theater <laughs> PC. There seems to be a lot of support out there and the functionality is there and it's a nice compact Drill device. some additional holes in it to give it better ventilation. But again, you're not going out to buy one of those new. That could be a little pricey. I think they're overpriced for what you get. Sorry. Like I said, it's the whole, if you already have it, put it to good use or repurpose stuff you already have, that kind of thing. Yeah. Hey, you know what? I'll tell you what. I'll show off XBMC and Boxy next week. Cool. We'll talk about Blu-ray drive options for your build. Maybe the week after that, we'll have our parts put together. Start looking up slimline Blu-ray drives. Oh, miniitx.com. It's a cool site. Cool. Let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been a GoDaddy customer forever. My wife's a GoDaddy customer. <laughs> it's really simple. We get URLs cheap. That's where we host our domains because it's cheap. It's cheap and they don't screw them up, which is nice. They also do pretty good web hosting and they do it without a long-term contract. You can go month to month. So if you're experimenting with a new website and it's not paying off, you can basically make the hosting go away without having it dumped in your credit card and showing up on your credit report and making your life miserable. And GoDaddy's hosting plans are pretty solid. 99% uptime. They got free 24-7 support. And of course, GoDaddy.com is one of our sponsors. It's kind of nice because I've been using them so I trust them and you can trust them too. Well, you can find out for yourself. Use the code HDN12. You can get 10 bucks off any order of $40 or more if you're registered in some domains or thinking about some web hosting. And if that doesn't work for you, we got a whole bunch of offers that kind of scale back and forth. You can choose the one that fits your needs. And you can find the HD Nation GoDaddy deals at revision3.com slash GoDaddy and you'll be supporting HD Nation by supporting our sponsors. I got a question for Robert. Sorry. Yay. <laughs> that was a little enthusiastic. Larry writes in, due to the size of my TV room and the location of the entertainment center, a quarter unit, I have decided to purchase a 32-inch HDTV to replace my failing standard diff, uh, standard diff, standard definition 27-inch TV. Where did that voice come from? He says he wants a 1080p set, LED backlighting, and he's thinking his choices is his choice is between the Samsung's UN32B6000V or the Sharp Aquos LN32LE700UN. And he asked, do you guys have any advice on which one is better or if there's a better 32-inch option out there. And he says to keep up the great work. Thanks, Larry. Nice. You are the master. So we got the B6000 versus the LE700, I yeah. believe is what he was talking about. So you got Samsung and LG, same screen size, same resolution. Cost is a difference. So the first thing I did was compare pricing. And I looked up online for these two TVs. And it turns out the Samsung is about, about $970. And the, uh, the Sharp is about, about $200 less, about oh, wow. $700. So, uh, 760 or so. It's like 20%. That's that's a good chunk of change. So if budget, if your budget's a big deal, when, when is it not? You might want to consider, you know, saving a little bit of money by going with Sharp's TV. These are both LED lit models. I believe Samsung is using an edge lit system, whereas Sharp is using a direct lit system. However, this particular model doesn't offer local dimming, that feature that allows the individual LEDs to dim in dark scenes. So it's it's more it's more similar actually in its performance to just standard fluorescent lighting. However, mm -hmm. you do get the improved color quality and performance out of the LED system, and probably some energy savings. I'm hoping. However, there is the price difference there, and I will say just from my experience with both TVs, I will say that chances are you're probably going to get a better black level out of what Char what, what uh, Samsung is doing with their 32 inch set compared right. to what you're going to get out of the Sharp TV. But otherwise. You know, so, it's a toss-up. It's really the price is what got me the most. Just to say, like, if they were the same price, you'd say go with the Samsung. Probably. If you need to save money, go with the Sharp. You probably won't notice the black levels. And compare, compare <laughs> integrated features, too. And uh, the other thing is I wasn't able to discern which of the surface finishes they were using on each display. But if the room is a big deal, uh, if you've got a lot of direct light that might be hitting the display, consider the one that has a matte finished surface. And if they both do, well, there's another checkbox for both. Andrew emails and just watch your latest episode and agree that it makes sense to view Blu-ray movies at their native aspect ratio. Thank you, Andrew, because some people thought I was full of hot wind. However, Andrew says, I just bought a new 42-inch Panasonic Plasma, and I've been watching everything in zoomed mode so as not to get any image retention or burn-in because of the big black bars in one place or the other. He's wanting to know, is it safe once in a while to watch a movie with black bars, or do I need to wear the TV in more? All right, Andrew. This is, I guess it's, you said it's all about the first... 100 hours, 100, that's, 200 that's hours. That's usually the, the rule of thumb for plasma displays is that you try not you try to avoid black bars mm -hmm. on the screen while you're watching active video for that first 100 hours or so of use, just to let all of the pixels wear in evenly mm -hmm. or to break them in in a nice way. That's one way to put it. Should you like pick a channel that does full screen 
you know, HDTV 24-7 and just let it burn in? I don't, I, I try not to do, well, you burn, could, okay, you I, could I'm, do that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm thinking like burn in, like burning in a new PC where you, you know, run something to make sure nothing breaks. Simulate you, each phosphor in the, each pixel evenly. That's what you're trying to, you're trying to basically evenly wear the screen. So basically in the first hours. hundred hours of a plasma, leaving black up here or down here or down here, if basically if you do nothing but watch movies with the big black bars, you can do damage in the first hundred hours. It's debatable. possibly. It possibly. Maybe. I, I would say it would be very difficult to do. The in TV theory. does quite a bit by <laughs> default, though, to prevent that from happening or any kind of permanent damage. However, general rule of thumb for plasma use, yeah, you want to leave everything full screen if possible for that first 100 hours. Watching one movie, it's not going to hurt a thing, let me tell you that. So if you, if you just want to flip it over, get the letter bars on there, or letter, <laughs> letter box uh, bars on there, by all means do so. Now, Panasonic does provide, by default, plenty of image retention tools, anti-image retention tools in the TV itself. And these are usually enabled by default anyway, but if you want to check them out, you can dive right into the settings, and in there you'll see the anti-image retention tool settings, and they include something called the pixel orbiter, the pillar bar brightness, and a scrolling <laughs> bar feature. Now, pixel orbiter is just what you think. It actually, by, by default, it will slightly move the picture around every so minutes oh, wow. so that it's not sitting in the same spot. So it's not going to move it drastically in order to, you know, if you've got letterbox bars up, it's not going to move it that much to get them completely off there. However, for, for regular content, especially things like the bugs you'll see in the corner of the screen from your, your broadcast mm -hmm. logo and things like that, that will get moved around a little bit over time. So it's not, it's not technically sitting still. Uh, the pillar bar brightness setting is more interesting to me because if you're looking at 4 by 3 content with the uh, pillar bars on each side, the black bars that would normally be there, you have a brightness setting. And if by default, it's on bright, where instead of being just black, it'll be a pretty bright gray. Mm -hmm. And one thing I do miss from the old days of Pioneer displays, their plasma displays in particular, was that their black bars, especially for pillar box 4 by 3 content, they would automatically analyze the picture and then it would make the brightness of those black bars whatever the average level is of the picture, so it would automatically try to wear everything equally. That was really nice. However, if, if you're nervous after you've watched something with letter boxes or pillar bars, that scrolling bar feature is basically a screen wipe function for the TV. So you just turn that on, <laughs> let it run for a couple of minutes, and it basically has a, a gradient, white, bright white to black, and it just kind of scrolls across the screen and gives everything a little shake up. It's the of Cylon itself. Eye actually exactly, going there. Exactly. <laughs> And that should keep you good. But I'll be honest with you, the latest plasma displays, and in this case, you have a very new TV, they are pretty tight and bulletproof, and they're rated to 100,000 hours nowadays. So I, I don't think you're going to damage it, but you're doing the right thing by breaking it in properly. But after that first 100 hours, you're nothing nuts. but movies. <laughs> ah. If you haven't seen it, Instant Messages is epic. It is evil. It is fun. It's really simple. They take some of the best things off the web. Craigslist posts, for example. I am conversations. Watch out. You're looking over your shoulder. And they dramatize them. They bring in professional actors to do weird things on screen. It is very cool. Just a few weeks ago, episode 8, guest starred the school teacher from Mad Men, Abigail Spencer. It was amazing. If you haven't seen it, go to risen3.com slash instant messages right now and check out one of the best new shows on the interwebs. Hey, we hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode of HD Nation. As always, we want to know what you think. So send your comments, questions, or suggestions to hdnation at revision3.com. You can hang out with other viewers in the HD Nation forums at revision3.com slash forum. And of course, anything we talk about, we try to put the links for that in the show notes. Go to the episode page at hdnation.tv. That's right. You'll also find all of the links to subscribe to the show. So if you're not getting the latest episode of HD Nation delivered to your door, what are you waiting for? That's right. Subscribe, watch on the platform you want, tell your friends, and until next time. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm Robert Heron. And I'm Patrick Norton. We'll see you next week on HD Nation. Bye, everyone.